So I did my presentation on overcoming racial bias with music um, during the 18th and 19th century. I provide an outline for you all and I'm gonna do like a flip classroom lecture so you can watch and follow along with me as I go through the topics that I cover in my paper and I'm gonna outline. So I'll see you in a second. Okay, so this is the outline that I made for you all that I posted. Kind of goes over, highlights the key points that I wrote about in my paper um, and they're um, labeled with the arrows right there with each topic. So the point of my paper and presentation was that I wanted to get the point across of how through our history music has evolved through innovations from both composers and performers during this time. African American music especially started out during the slave era, which I'll talk about later, and was used at first to tell stories or as a coping mechanism for each other. Um, but African American music aided in the battle against racial bias and stereotyping by becoming the face of American music or the American sound. And this was made possible through all the points that I will talk about. So through African Americans gaining musical voice in the Civil War, um, African American women composers demanding respect as skilled and equal professional performers, the transformation from spirituals to a legitimate higher art form or actual musical genre, and composers developing their musical compositions with different cultural influences, including those of African Americans and other minorities. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the Civil War. So African American men were not, African American men were not um, allowed to really be soldiers in the actual battlefield, but they did receive brass instruments to be bandsmen. And so this gave them really the first instance of them receiving musical training and having these instruments. And at the conclusion of the war, many of these musicians went on to perform in other regimental um, war bands. So pictured here is the Arlington, Virginia band of the 107th US Colored Infantry with their brass instruments. So you can kind of see in the video. And then the next thing that we're gonna talk about is one of the band masters that was very popular during this time. His name was Francis Johnson. He was a bandmaster in Philadelphia. Um, he gained great popularity after his music was actually published. Um, they published his collection of new cotillions in 1817 in Philadelphia. This was the first instance of a black band leader having his musical compositions actually published. Um, his group actually performed at schools and other private events. Prominent uh, military regiments like the Washington Guards Company 3 Band and the First Troop Philadelphia City Cavalry also hired Johnson's Ensemble to perform with them. Um, so his group was actually allowed to perform for Queen Victoria in England, which was a big deal. And he also became the first black musician to perform in an integrated music event in the U.S. And then the next thing that we can talk about is the African-American women composers. Um, a lot of African-American women composers were expected to support the minstrel shows or perform in vaudeville shows and their musical skills and capabilities were being undermined or stereotyped by primarily the white audiences. But these two performers, Greenfield and Jones, helped set the tone in the fact that they could be talented equals and not just considered talented based on their race or gender. So Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield was born a slave sometime in 1817 in the US. She had an enormously talented voice, but she never received any sort of vocal trainings. So she was just pure talent. She mostly performed in Great Britain, but then suffered a lot of financial instability and had to come back to the US because she couldn't really financial, financially support her own tours. Um, so her personal music career ended, but she came back to the US to help teach voice lessons to students to help influence the future generations of music. Cicerietta Jones performed primarily in minstrel and vaudeville shows at first with her group called the Black Patty Troubadours, but her passion was singing opera in the concert halls. Um, her fans gave her the name Black Patty to reference um, or to compare her really to Italian's um, favorite opera singer named Adelina Patty. 
but Jones wanted to be given her own musical identity rather than being compared to other people. So she decided that she wanted to be called Madam Jones instead of that because she wanted to be looked at as highly sophisticated and professional. She was the first African-American woman to a headline at Carnegie Hall, as well as being the first to sing a lead role at the Met Opera. She constantly fought to break racial barriers. Um, she always spoke out against like African-American struggles and stereotypes, including about how she would struggle to find places to live on tour as many hotels wouldn't allow her to stay there. And she had to perform for highly segregated audiences. So all the African-American audience members were forced to sit in the very back and she thought that that was unfair because they couldn't see her as well. And the next thing that we will talk about is the spiritual, wrong page. Yep, there we go. Okay. So, transforming the spiritual. So, my guy on my online says, where did the spiritual come from? Great question. So, <laughs> spirituals originated during the slave era, during the 18th century. This music consisted of biblical tunes, call and response shouts, and improvisation. This music, like I said before, was a way for slaves to communicate with each other, tell stories, provide a sense of hope. And many composers and performers were inspired by the purpose of this and the stories behind them. And they really liked the amount of heavy emotion that spirituals had. And so they tried to turn the spiritual into a high art musical genre. One of these groups was the Fisk Jubilee Singers, which are in this picture. And it was started at Fisk University by George L. White Fisk, who was a professor who started the group. They ended up going on tour, on an international tour in 1871, where they received fame and recognition. They surprised their primarily white audiences with their talent and song and performance choice because they were not singing the typical minstrel or vaudeville show songs. They sang the hired spirituals that they had arranged and adapted to make it more of a choral arrangement. And so eventually this ended up being very popular with the fans and they were looked at as a very professional choral group and eventually they ended up sparking interest in the U.S. And then the last thing I'll talk about, which I gave you a little preview earlier by accident, is the actual composers that helped form this type of African-American musical identity and that was Louis Moreau Gottschalk. Um, so at the time, obviously, military band music was popular. Like I said, spirituals were becoming popular. Um, but the idea of writing actual music that was heavily influenced by a culture besides European was still a very new idea because American music was very influenced by Europe at this time. And so Louis Moreau Gottschalk tried to think outside the box with this, with his style of writing. He was a very famous pianist and composer who combined his highly complex piano style with African-American influence and also Latin American influence as well. Um, he was born actually in New Orleans, but he moved to Latin America in his early adulthood and early career life in order to really absor absorb all the culture and the musical sounds of the Creole people. He was the first American musician to sample music. His influence was also popular music. He wanted to be able to reach a wider audience and so he wanted to be able to write music based on what was popular during the time and what was popular in the US. His works consisted of folk melodies from the Creole people as well as African American spirituals. His work was highly syncopated and improvisational and this is said to be a heavy influence on composers that we know today as like Scott Joplin and Jelly Roll Morton who helped develop ragtime blues and jazz and so um, Gottschalk is accredited to inspiring the people that are very popular with ragtime and so in a way all of these different people and groups helped evolve music and allowed spirituals and African-American culture to really be accepted by America as a whole and it actually ironically ended up creating the American musical sound. 
So I'm gonna show you some music clips. So I'm gonna do a little transition here. Now I'm gonna show you the Goss Chalk piece that I found, it's called Bambala. It's um, the piece that I was mentioning about how he used Creole melodies and like folk-like and dance music in order to create his very complicated and sophisticated, syncopated, rhythmic piano pieces. And so I'm gonna show you this. So here's some of his Bambala. Now I'm gonna show you um, one of the pieces from Frank Johnson or Francis Johnson's um, published compositions. This is his Philadelphia Fireman's Cotillion. It has that very like a beat march like feel even though it's just the piano and so that kind of reminded me of the typical civil war band music unfortunately i didn't get any recordings of sis Rietta jones or elizabeth taylor greenfield performing i couldn't find a single video probably because they may have not had a recording um capability at that time but you should definitely go listen to some of Johnson's works, maybe listen to some Civil War band music or Goth's Chalk. Um, so really cool and you can definitely tell the influence that this type of music had on ragtime and blues and jazz, which is my favorite type of music. So 